Taka Goodrich, welcome to the show. Welcome to Become Your Own Superhero. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be here. Pleasure to talk to you again. Again, this, Taka, thank you for your time today. This is such an important interview for me personally, and I, and I hope that our audience will see the same. And the reason being, I'm going to preface a little bit about what we're going to talk about today. I feel like I need to do that with some of these longer interviews, maybe. We are going to show you today, or you're going to show us today, how you can improve the health of yourself, your family, and future generations. It's that simple. My very first question for you today, are there any articles on PubMed that you haven't read? Oh, my God. Yeah. One or two million. <laughs> I mean, PubMed's got, last time I looked at the top line number, I think it was like 24 million articles. Even on one of my favorite topics, oxidative stress, there are something like 250,000 articles. So there's a lot of material out there of obviously varying quality, but there's a lot of stuff. Well, I, I feel like that you are an Idaho version of me, given our similar interest in hiking and running or barefoot and uh, Phil Maffetone and, and dietary stuff and our interest in nutrition. But um, people are going to go, all right, get to the good bit, but we need to give them some context about how you ended up where you are and what you're doing. So for those that haven't heard of Tucker Goodrich, what's your story, Tucker? So I... Uh started on Wall Street in a stockbroker training program um, with a company called Lehman Brothers, which later became extremely famous in a really bad sort of way. Um, and ultimately, pretty quickly wound up on the asset management side of things, which means, you know, taking uh, basically running money for rich people for a fee, and then at that point, I got into IT and, you know, then proceeded into the hedge fund space, which is, you know, I'm sure everybody's got a basic familiarity with, which is where you take lots of money from really rich people and borrow even more money from banks and, you know, hopefully make an enormous amount of money. Um, so I started doing that as a trader and, you know, continued to get into the IT side of things. Um, the average career of a trader on Wall Street is three years, um, and they generally leave in disgrace. So my career as a trader was three years, and I wound up leaving still up. So I did a little better than average. <laughs> and uh, But I was really good at the IT stuff. And so when I, you know, my company told me they were exiting the trading strategy that I was doing, which was international merger arbitrage. They asked me to take on the IT part of the business and to develop a database that I had designed into a firm-wide risk management system. So I did that and went into the IT side of things and the risk management side of things full-time, which was a really great experience. Um, and all of the IT stuff that I did, and I'll go into this a little more than I usually do uh, because of the title of your podcast. Uh, all of it was self-taught. I'd never taken a class in technology or programming or anything else since the eighth grade, um, you know, in uh, eighth grade and, you know, before high school. Um, but what I found was that I, you know, I had a kind of a knack for it and I wasn't afraid to try things. And, you know, I pretty quickly realized that I was as good or better at it than most of the people who were doing it professionally and but the main thing was just being willing to try things and not being intimidated by it right and um you know so for instance i when i uh transition when i got this first job at this uh hedge fund uh a startup hedge fund i'd never put a computer together before in my life <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even really own a computer. I used them exclusively at work. So when the fellow who wanted to start up the hedge fund told me he was going to do it, he gave me about nine months lead time so that I could educate myself. And okay, so I put the infrastructure together to start up a hedge fund. It went flawlessly the first time around. 
the company that was setting us up noticed that, and they were the guys who ultimately offered me a job and made me their chief technology officer. When I took that job, I knew, but they didn't know that I was going to need to be a programmer to do what they had hired me to do. Um, so I taught myself on the job um, and, you know, succeeded, got the project in on time um, and according to specs and, you know, just it's amazing what you can do if you're willing to take a couple of risks and, um, you know, willing to push yourself a little bit. So, you know, it progressed and I still don't have any academic credentials in uh, information technology in that field and wound up with 20 odd people working for me and, you know, a company with billions of dollars of assets under management, depending on my systems. Um, so it was pretty cool. And that kind of has a lot of bearing on the health stuff because when I finally started paying attention to that, I had already trained myself up to being an industry expert, almost entirely self-taught. Now I won't say I, you know, I had a lot of mentors and people who I got advice from, um, but at the end of the day, it was just me saying, okay, sometimes literally saying, okay, I have no idea what I'm doing here. I have to figure out some resources to help me, you know, do this and going out and looking and finding them and, you know, putting things together. I'm so glad that you included that, Tucker, because uh, that is so inspirational for people that are struggling with direction and this uh, limiting belief about what they can achieve or what they can't achieve, rather, with no formal education. And as someone who never made it out of high school or even went to university, uh, I can really empathize with that. And I'm confident in my own skill set that I am becoming world class. Uh, which sounds like a really grandiose statement, but the proof will be in the pudding and will be evidenced by, you know, how, however I'm vindicated or not in the future, I suppose. Yep. What happened proof to your in health? The pudding. Well, so I was, uh, you know, kind of an average, uh, I was pretty active, kind of an average guy. I'd been putting on about a pound a year since I was in my 20s. When I was in the middle, my middle 20s, I got really sick for about four or five days and uh, didn't go to the doctor, just kind of, you know, stayed at home and sweated out the fever and some other rather nasty side effects or symptoms, which we'll get into later. Um, you know, but after that, my health was never quite the same. I wound up with um, uh chronic diarrhea. I started putting on weight. Um, I wound up having all sorts of autoimmune symptoms, a um, lot of, you know, infections, sinus, serial sinus infections and all this stuff. Um, I was hospitalized a number of times for gastric bleeding. You know, the lining of the stomach would rupture and I feel a little full and go... <laughs> a little nauseous and go throw up a, you know, half a gallon of blood into the toilet. That was not good. Um, but I basically just thought it was all, you know, the physicians were pretty much useless at telling me what was going on. Um, finally, when I was 38 and, um, you know, probably about 20 pounds overweight at this point, you know, nothing dramatic, but, you know, enough so I couldn't, you know, I'd stuck all the clothes I was wearing in my early twenties into a box on the assumption that at some point I would figure out how to lose weight. <laughs> Since I'm cheap, I didn't want to throw them out. <laughs> um, so, uh, so one day I was driving, you know, I was, um, so one day I'm driving to work and uh, I'd been skiing over the weekend and I looked, you know, all of a sudden I'm driving down the highway and all of a sudden this car pops into existence right in front of me. And I'm like, where the hell did that come from? And I looked over to the right and I realized there was an entrance ramp with a long line of cars coming up. And that if I looked straight ahead of me, I couldn't see any of them, right? The vision on this, on the right side, about the right third had just vanished. It was like a giant blind spot. Right. So it wasn't like it was dark. It was just there was nothing there. 
And this car was the first car up the exit ramp. And when it popped out of the blind spot, it fe felt like it just appeared in front of me. So, you know, I was on the way to work. So I was like, okay, this is weird, but you know, I feel fine other than that. And, you know, I'll deal with it later. Um, so I get to work, I get on a conference call and uh, somebody asked me a question and I can't get the answer out. You know, I can think of what I want to say, but the words won't come out. And I didn't really know what to do about this, but you know, the guy's like, Tucker, are you there? Are you okay? And I was finally, you know, I was able to get out. Okay. I'm not feeling well. I have to get off the call. And I went to see my boss um, and, you know, I was able to get out. I can't talk. One of the guys who worked with us had been an emergency medical technician and he diagnosed me as being in the middle of having a stroke, 38 years old. Um, he luckily knew where the local stroke uh, specialist hospital was and popped me in his car and drove me over there, you know, so I wouldn't have to get in an ambulance and then go to the local hospital and then get transferred over to the other hospital. Um, so I get in there and spend the next four days in a stroke ward, which was not fun, <laughs> as you might imagine. Um, it was a teaching hospital. So when the, uh, doctor, you know, the neurologist came around who had a specialty in stroke came around with his med students, they were like, you know, fascinated. And one of them said to me, you know, you, oh, you're really, I was like, I must be really boring for you guys. And they were like, no, you're really interesting. You're young. We never see young people in here. And I'm like, oh, fabulous. You know, that's the worst thing you want to hear when you're in the hospital. <laughs> you're interesting. This is so exciting. You know, oh, wonderful. So the doctor explained to me the risks of stroke, which basically means, you know, once you have one, you've got a 4% chance per year of having another one. 4% every year. Cumulative? So it's now each year, 4% each year. So cumulative, it's like a guarantee when you're 38 years old that you are going to be having more strokes, right? Jesus. Um, yeah, so it's kind of bad news. Um, and, you know, the stroke left me with a slight speech impediment, which the neurologist was able to test for and confirm. Um, and then, you know, I went through the next couple of months of doing every test known to man, none of which showed any of the symptoms of or signs of a stroke. Okay, so I was the big mystery. And this neurologist, I will say, because I can often be pretty hard on the medical profession, he was wonderful. At one point, he actually spent like three hours in his office with me on a Friday night just going over the science and medicine of stroke. So I would understand what was going on with me and going through all of my symptoms and showing me like, you know, other people's uh, CAT scan images versus mine saying, look, this part here is where he bled out. You don't have that. So I don't know why what happened to you happened to you. He said, you know, so anyway, it was, it was, it was an interesting experience. And I started doing my own research and ultimately got him to change his diagnosis from stroke to migraine, which has a big impact in terms of, you know, health insurance and all that. But the fact that I came back on all the stroke tests and was able to find a paper in the medical literature that showed a similar progression of symptoms without it being a stroke made him comfortable doing that. And he said to me, this is the first time I've ever changed a diagnosis based on information a patient's given me. So, okay. So I kind of said, you know, clearly I have some ability to figure out what's going on here, looking at the literature, which is all I had ever done, you know, on Wall Street or in IT was just do research to figure out what was going on. This was just a new field, new area for me. Um, so two years after that, I came down with um, acute diverticulitis. Um, now, acute diverticulitis basically means, you know, di diverticulitis is this condition where you get these pouches in your colon and it becomes acute when one of them gets infected and perforates. So you have a hole in the side of your colon, which means the poop is leaking out into your abdomen, which can lead to 
uh, sepsis ultimately and death. <laughs> Um, this was another Monday morning thing at the office, you know, I was getting these cramps and was lying down on the floor trying to relax and not wanting to go back to that to a New York hospital, which are pretty dreadful I hopped in my car and drove myself back home to the Connecticut went to see my doctor. He diagnosed me sent me to the emergency room driving by the way to the emergency room when you have a perforated colon is a bad idea. Um, just if anybody out there is thinking about it. Um, I barely was able to park the car. I walked into the emergency room and told them what my doctor had said, and he called ahead. And uh, the woman, so the woman, the nurse starts doing triage on me, and she hooks me up to this automatic blood pressure monitoring thing, you know, blows up the little balloon around your arm. Well, that said I was dead. <laughs> <laughs> And as she's doing this, I'm, I apparently turned white and just slouched down into the chair. And, you know, the last thing I remember hearing was her screaming, medic, medic, get me a stretcher, you know. And um, so four more days in that hospital. Thank God I had an excellent surgeon who didn't do surgery. Um, but, you know, here I am again in the hospital with my phone doing research and again, Diverticulitis typically occurs in older people. 80% of Americans have diverticulitis by the time they're 80. And, uh, you know, occasionally starts to occur in people as young as 40. Two weeks past my 40th birthday, I was pissed. <laughs> I was like, you got to be kidding me. So here I am, 40 years old. I've come down with two diseases of old age, right? Um, although the stroke turned out not to be a stroke, thank God, but um, didn't leave me with these migraines periodically where I would lose vision and the ability to speak. That's kind of a problem. Um, and uh, so the doctor came in and he said, well, you're not going to be able to eat any more fatty fried foods. And I was like, I haven't been able to eat that stuff for 20 years. It makes me nauseous. I can't even touch that stuff. He's like, well, you have to eat more fiber. I was like, it's like all I bloody eat is freaking salads and whole wheat bread. You know, this, I was like, okay, fine. So Mr. Whole Wheat. Yes. That's where I really became Mr. Whole Wheat. Um, you've heard that story. Maybe, did I tell you that last time we were talking? Uh, so, I like to do my research. Okay. So I used to, um, my Twitter handle was Mr. Whole Wheat for a couple of weeks. <laughs> oh, my, my followers God. out so much. I had to change <laughs> it back. <laughs> so, you know, um, so I start trying to eat more fiber and the diverticulitis keeps getting worse. I keep going to have, going on these courses of antibiotics and finally need to have a colon resection where they cut eight inches of the colon, the sigmoid colon out. Um, how long is the colon incidentally? Any idea? Well, well, they took eight inches out. You've got a lot more than eight inches. I think it's maybe 12 feet long, eight feet long, something like that. Um, it's still a reasonable chunk though, isn't it? Like, It's a good chunk and it changes the way your bowel functions in a way that's a little irritating. Um, I asked the gastroenterologist who I went to see um, as part of the diagnosis. I said, so, you know, so, oh yeah, so one of the symptoms of this acute diverticulitis when I was in the hospital, after a couple of days, I started bleeding out the rectum. And that, you know, I'd start feeling, they weren't feeding me anything at that point because they can't feed you things when you have a hole in your rectum or in your colon, obviously. Um, so it was like a four day fast basically. And I would start feeling full and I would, you know, go to the bathroom and just, blood would come out, you know, liters of blood. So that was one of the symptoms that had happened back in my 20s. That's, you know, so I realized that this was the second attack that I had had. Um, and from the first attack, I had had this chronic diarrhea for at this point, 14 years, uh, which ne necessitated me carrying a roll of toilet paper around in a backpack, you know, because I mean, when I had to go, I had to go. It was not like a negotiation. <laughs> um, hostage very negotiation. Huh? Like a hostage negotiation. <laughs> if anything. Yeah, ex exactly. Um, and I mean, I was, you know, into whitewater kayaking and skiing and 
all this stuff and it, it was a problem. So anyway, so I asked the gastroenterologist, the gastroenterologist, sorry, um, will this help with this chronic diarrhea I've had? And he just shrugged, you know, I'm like, okay, well, whatever. Well, it didn't have help as it happened, the colon resection. So I'm still sick. I'm not having the symptoms of the acute diverticulitis, so I don't have to go on antibiotics all the time. So that's a plus, but, um, you know, it's, it wasn't curative. They told me it would be curative. I found out since then that it's only curative about 60% of the time, the colon resection for diverticulitis. Um, and of course they have no idea why. And nobody told me anything except not to eat stuff that I already wasn't eating. Um, I mean, as I think, you know, as I, I think as we discussed in the call, we had a little while ago, we did, we did a, just so everybody knows why I keep saying this, we did a really long chat, um, prior to doing this podcast where we discussed a lot of these topics, you know, just in passing. Um, so, you know, I'd been sugar-free since I was a teenager because of dental problems. So, you know, by most people's standards, I was eating a pretty good diet. I wasn't eating a lot of junk food. I wasn't eating a lot of candy or snacks or what, or whatever, you know, sweets, snacks or whatever. Um, I eliminated my cavity problem. So that was great, but I was still getting sick and still getting fat. Um, so a couple of years go by, I get into this barefoot running thing, which we'll discuss later on, um, which was a total mind bomb because everything, you know, this, I read this book, Born to Run by Christopher McDougall and chapter 25 is all about the science of shoes and running uh, with this scientist, Dan Lieberman. And I read this and it absolutely blew my mind because I was a runner, but I'd never been able to run because I would get shin splints, you know, and I bought these Vib Vibram five finger shoes several years before the book came out just on a lark. So I was like, wait a minute, this is, you know, you're telling me what I was doing is the right thing. And, you know, it just, it blew my mind. It was the only book that I've ever read where I read the book, I put it down and the next night I picked it up and I read it again. Just so through that process, one of the guys I met through that, uh, Justin Owings sent me this blog post um, from this PhD student. Uh, at the time he was a PhD student, Stefan Guillenet. And he went on about dental health and how dental health is not due to genetics, but entirely due to diet. And, you know, I went through and I read all the research that he referred to, and it was completely convincing to me. And it corresponded with my experience, you know, cutting sugar out. Um, so I kept reading his blog and reading all the research that he linked to. And after a couple of months, I was like, okay, you know, I went down to the cafeteria at work and was in the salad, I got to the end of the salad bar line and I looked at the squeeze bottles of salad dressing there and I thought to myself, these have got to be the worst, nastiest oils available to man to make it into this salad bar. <laughs> I was like, so what happens if I just stop eating them today, right? So this was on a Friday. So as I recall, I put some vinegar on my salad and, you know, that was it. Two days later, my, at this point, 16 years of chronic diarrhea ended. Absolutely blew me away. Um, what also went away almost immediately was my carb cravings. I tried going low carb to lose weight and had never been able to get around the carbohydrate cravings. Um, so I went a week, I became cold, low carb because I forgot to eat any for a week. It just didn't occur to me. And then at the end of the week, I went to the, uh, back down to the cafeteria and got myself a sandwich with whole wheat bread and felt horrible. And one of Stefan's other things was how bad wheat is for, which I thought was nuts because I was like, well, I'm healthy and I eat lots of whole wheat. I'm, you know, I tell my daughters, I'm Mr. Whole Wheat. You should eat whole wheat too. And they hated it and wouldn't touch the stuff. Smart kids. In Smart hindsight. kids. <laughs> um, so then I'm like, wait a minute, could I be one of these people with a wheat problem? So now I was in like experimentation mode, right? 
I mean, applied scientific method is the essence of engineering. And I was eff effectively a self-taught engineer at that point. So I was like, okay, we're going to skip carbs for another week. And then next Friday, I'll try something else. And next Friday, the guys in the office ordered some pizza. So I had two slices of pizza and it wiped me out. I thought I was having a heart attack. My heart was pounding. I was lying on the sofa in my office, just being like, oh my God, what is happening to me? And that was when I started figuring everything out. And, you know, the, my, the chronic diarrhea went away. My, um, I found out that the, you know, the migraine symptoms, the loss of vision and the loss of speech were all the result of wheat. Um, I could recreate my diverticulitis symptoms whenever I wanted to by eating wheat or eating seed oils. The weight just dropped off me. I mean, two months, you know, my 20 years of pound a year just disappeared. I put on my pants one morning, buckled, you know, put my belt on, let go, and they fell to my ankles which is a great thing to have happen, except it's, it was very expensive to have to go get all my clothes tailored. And I mean, you know, that was 11 years ago. I've been weight stable for 11 years. Um, I stopped, I pretty quickly figured out that I wasn't really susceptible to sunburn anymore, which is, you know, something we should get into. I'd read one guy's account where he said that was the case. And that was another thing I thought, well, that's crazy. And then, you know, when I, when it happened to me, it happened to me, um, my ex-wife and I went to a barefoot running event in New York City in Central Park in early April before the leaves had come out on the trees. So we're out there standing in the sun for two and a half hours, which would normally be, you know, normally it would take 45 minutes for me to get a roasted sunburn. So we're out there for two and a half hours. We go back home and my ex-wife comes to me and she says, look at the burn I got out there. And I looked at myself and I said, honey, I didn't burn. Now, if your audience can't see me, I'm blonde and blue eyed and pretty pale. <laughs> pretty Anglo-Saxon. <laughs> pretty Anglo-Saxon. Um, but my ex-wife was Colombian and dark skinned, dark hair, dark eyes would get, you know, loved the beach, would get really brown, and she burned, and I didn't. And I was like, oh, yeah, somebody said that this was one of the things that could happen. And at that, you know, again, experiment mode. So the next thing was we had a family trip planned to go to Disney World. So I was down in Florida for three days, no sunscreen, no sunburn. I've the only I've used sunscreen once since then on the fourth day of being in the French Alps at 13,000 feet on the sun skiing, where I was like, okay, you know, I'd been out there for three days already with no sunburn. And I was like, let's not push it. <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's been amazing, but I got, you know, what bothered me was first how quickly all of this stuff resolved and how none of the stuff that I changed was ever anything that any of my doctors had mentioned to me, right? I mean, when I finally went into my doctor and told him I was changing my diet and, you know, going for a high fat, low carb diet, he was like, I'm really concerned about that, Tucker. Your cholesterol is a little high and, you know, you're a little, uh, your insulin levels are a little high. You're like pre-diabetic. And I was like, well, that's fine, doc. I mean, if I'm killing myself, then it's your job to tell me, but let's see what happens. And, you know, by the time I finally stopped seeing him, because I didn't need to see a doctor anymore, his diagnosis was, you're going to live to a hundred. You're like in perfect health now. It's incredible. So. Well, first things first, Tucker, Congra <laughs> con congratulations, congratulations on f like finding this out because the net result, I believe, is that the information that we are about to share or you're about to share especially will affect the global population directly or indirectly. And I know I make some pretty grandiose statements on this podcast sometimes, but I fundamentally believe that the knowledge that you have acquired is so rare not even some of the smartest doctors, and I use that term loosely, have even heard about what we're going to discuss. The first point, people are wondering, why 
why were you not burning? What's the mechanism behind the sunburn and not burning? Oh, well, that one's, you know, so there are a bunch of topics on uh, seed oils, right? I, the term I use is seed oils to distinguish it from vegetable oils. Because if you say vegetable oils, you include things like olive oil and coconut oil that are pretty healthy. Um, seed oils are things that are made from like seeds, obviously, like it's corn like or soybeans or canola. peanuts or canola, which is made from rapeseed. Um, the difference between uh, what we should call fruit oils, like olive oil or coconut oil or avocado oil, is that they have a lot less omega-6 fats. Seed oils tend to have high amounts of omega-6 fats, like you know, 50 to 70% of the fat is omega-6. And, you know, olive oil, a bad, what I would call a bad olive oil is going to be about 20% omega-6. A good olive oil is going to be about 2% omega-6. Um, same thing for avocado oil. There's a lot of variation nat naturally in, you know, olive and avocado oil, but they tend to be a lot, lot lower. And, and so, just for it, just just to cut you off, Tucker. Sorry, just for our audience that aren't super duper uh, au fait on the scientific um, terminology that we're using, human beings require amounts of omega six to exist. It's virtually impossible to have an omega six free diet unless it's done in a lab, if I'm not mistaken, Tucker. Um, so just just if you can base it around that, but the yeah. issue is with the amounts of omega six, and that's what we'll go into if it's right. Right. So we've you know, everybody's heard of fish oil, fish, without getting into why they call them omega-6 and omega-3, it has to do with the structure of the fat molecule. Um, we won't go into why they're named that because it's kind of beside the point. Um, they're both what we call polyunsaturated fats, which means what makes a fat saturated is that it has a full complement of hydrogen atoms around the carbon atoms that make up the backbone of the fat. Um, a polyunsaturated fat is missing a bunch of those hydrogen atoms, varying amounts, depending on which fat it is. Again, all of this is kind of beside the point, but this terminology is important because if you have a polyunsaturated fat, it is much less stable than a saturated fat or a monounsaturated fat, which is missing only one hydrogen atom, like the fats that we find in olive oil. So they are susceptible to oxidative damage. And when they are oxidized, they break down into a wide variety of other compounds, some of which are highly toxic to humans. Um, this is distinct from saturated and monounsaturated fats like fats and olive oil, because they are far less susceptible to breaking down into these toxic uh, byproducts. And this is important when you look at things like sunburn or uh, age-related macular degeneration, because light and UV light is enough to cause these things to break down into toxins. So when you get a sunburn, right, what's happening is the UV light is breaking these fats down into highly toxic chemicals in your skin. And that's what's causing the inflammatory reaction and the cellular damage. And this is, this, by the way, was one of the first things that I learned on this journey and was the whole reason I originally decided to try not eating these oils anymore because of a now since unfortunately deleted post by Stefan Guillenet that went through the animal models where they found out, hey, we can dial up or down how fast these hairless mice that we used for human skin cancer experiments can get skin cancer by how much polyunsaturated fats we give them. And in turn, in fact, if you didn't give them any polyunsaturated fats at all, you couldn't induce skin cancer. <laughs> Kind of an interesting bit of information there, isn't it? So th this is something that I've experienced firsthand, and I've spoken about this on a, on a number of other podcasts, um, my resistance to the sun. And my diet is almost devoid of poly, like poofers, seed oils. Uh, there is, and it, it has come to light that some of the 
salmon, the smoked salmon that I've been eating uh, is farmed. I don't know what they feed the the farmed salmon. I don't know whether they oil. use. Soy well, is it is oil. it would it definitely be that? Yeah. Fuck. I mean, there are other things they can feed it, but that's you know one of the scientists that we'll talk about as we go through this conversation looked specifically at farm fed salmon and after she demonstrated that omega-6 fats cause obesity in a mouse model she then she was norwegian so she went you know back to norway and started working with the people who make the farm fed salmon that you probably ate and she was able to show that soybean oil made the salmon fat and sick and that if you fed the salmon to mice, the mice also got fat and sick. Now, the omega-3 fats that are in the salmon, you know, salmon get a lot less omega-6 fat than some other animals we'll talk about, but, and they do have the more protective omega-3 fats, fish oil. Um, so it's definitely better for you than some other things that you could eat, but I'm definitely myself a big fan of wildcat, wild caught fish. Um, plus it tastes better. Yeah, it, it absolutely does. And something that's uh, come to light recently, Tucker, I used to go through a lot of eggs uh, for a number of years. That was like up to 10 eggs at a time in some cases, right? Mm -hmm. And I recently made a two egg omelet, put one bite in my mouth, cooked in ghee, and had an immediate vomitory response. And I was like, what is happening? These are the best eggs that I could get. And upon further inspection, the, the laws in Victoria, the state of Victoria and Australia where we are, during droughts, they are allowed to feed the chickens soy meal and still ah. call them pastured or organic. And I'm wondering whether I had a response to the soy meal that was bioaccumulated in the egg. What are your thoughts on that? I mean, that's not much. Typically for people to get a... a response of nausea to eating seed oils, they've got to eat a lot. But, you know, I don't know. Uh, it would be interesting. You know, that gets my scientific mind going. I would want to do some experiments on you, tie you up and feed you different eggs. <laughs> within within 30 <laughs> seconds, within 30 <laughs> seconds, I was in the toilet with my head in the toilet. Um, that bad, really and, interesting. And okay. the, I've since eaten the ghee and had no problems at all. So there was no other mitigating factor uh so it's only it's only uh correlative it's not causative just to preface is that right um anyway. well you know don't don't go too crazy i mean you had an effect right i would not stop eating eggs because that happens to me once but i would definitely start doing some experiments i mean there are people who come down with um you know chicken allergies uh so it's possible that could be, like I don't know, but I would certainly get some DC, see if you could get some decent farm pastured eggs and try it again. Well, one of the, with the areas of interest, when I watched the interview between you and Dr. Joe McCullough, he was talking about how his, uh, he was feeding his, his chickens, uh, the, the, the grain and the grain was, um, no, the, the mealworms rather were potentially yes. soy fed so now he has to farm his own fucking worms to try and so we're, we're going a bit off topic but um i hope people are comprehending what we're what we're talking about here but and if we sorry you go, yeah, this, you go no 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 this is this is a good point to make um that it you know different animals react to what they eat in different ways specifically concerning seed oils right cattle and ruminants like you know goats and sheep have bacteria in their gut that they basically pre-process the food that they eat so one of the things that happens when you feed a cow a lot of seed oils is that their rumen basically filters it out right this doesn't happen in what's you know cows have four stomachs we probably all learned and you know when we were little kids animals that are monogast, one stomach, like people or chickens or pigs, don't have that protective mechanism of a rumen with a lot of bacteria in it pre-processing food. So we tend to just 
accumulate these uh, omega-6 fats in our body. Whereas cattle, you know, a cattle will go from 1% to 2%. A person will go from 1% to 20% omega-6 fats. The same is true in chickens and pigs. So it matters what you feed them as they demonstrated in that salmon experiment. And for chicken, for instance, in the United States, chicken is apparently the number one source of omega-6 fats in our diet, more even than the seed oils, because that's what they're feeding the chickens, corn and soy and soybean oil and, you know, all the cheapest ingredients that they can get to fatten them up. So would, would deep fried chicken be the one of the worst things you could put on your body? <laughs> it's up there with French fries. They're t- touch and go. Yeah. I mean, yeah, and, they're okay. really up there. So uh, let's say, so pork, for example, why is pork uh, a, a potential problem? Chick, well, so these animal experiments, I mean, you know, so they have this diet um, that they feed animals in labs. Uh, it's called D12492. Um, it's made by this company called Research Diets in New Jersey here in the United States. And the ingredients include lard, right? Pork fat and soybean oil. And several years ago, a blogger, Chris Masterjohn, who if you haven't had on your show, you should, um, got a letter from uh, the company saying, oh, we figured out that we were using the USDA nutrient database to come up with our estimates of the fatty acid composition of this diet. And it turns out that it's actually got twice as much omega-6 fats as we thought it did in the lard, right? Because what they've been feeding the pigs over the years has changed and the USDA never updated their composition. You know, it depends on what the animals are fed. So, I mean, you can get pastured pork and it's going to be perfectly healthy, or you can get industrial, you know, what I call industrial pork and, you know, it's going to be chock full of omega-6 fats, evidently. Um, So that scientist uh, who did the salmon experiment, the first experiment that she did was with uh, the national, the U.S. National Institutes of Health, and she demonstrated, well, the title of the study really says the whole thing, linoleic acid, which is the omega-6 fat found in seed oils, induces obesity, right? And she showed that if you lowered the linoleic acid content and increased the saturated fat content, they didn't get obese. And really interestingly, if you increased the linoleic, the omega-6 content, and also increased the omega-3 content, right, the DHA that's in fish oil, they got, they were protected against obesity. So it's a pretty clear demonstration of causation there wow. to get back to, right? So the model that they were using for their diet, the composition was almost the same as this D12492 diet. So we can infer from their result that the obesogenic element in this diet, that's the number one obesogenic diet in labs in the world is the omega-6 fats. And we've got a bunch of studies that have been done that have confirmed that result, right? So is is there a part of the pig that's uh, has less concentration of the linoleic acid, like the muscle meat, or is it the squeal? <laughs> That's probably my favourite answer ever to a question. <laughs> Fuck. So, 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 yeah, well, but think about this. Think about this, right? So, I mean, one of the problems that we have, like, if you're diabetic, one of the signs that you're diabetic is that you have intramuscular fat, right? So the interstices between your fat cells and inside the, or your muscle cells and inside the muscle cells is becoming full of fat, okay? That's a sign that you're sick, right? So the the USDA, the United States Department of Agriculture has a grading system for cattle. And what criteria do they use to grade a cattle, a cow as having more desirable meat by the amount of intramuscular fat, right? If you get grass-fed beef 
what you will see, I mean, you can go to the supermarket and you can see it now because it's so common. You will see that it is dark red. It has yellow fat around the edges and it has no marbling, right? The grain finished USDA grade has marbling. Marbling is caused when they take the cow off the pasture and start feeding it corn and typically some kind of seed oils. That's what it does to us. <laughs> it makes you marbled. So yeah, so for a pig, you know, or a chicken for that matter, certainly the muscle is going to be a lot better. I mean, you know, if anybody wants to go eat white chicken breast, knock yourself out, just don't eat the chicken fat. Um, I personally prefer beef because even grain fed beef is going to be a lot healthier from a fatty acid perspective than, you know, industrial grain fed pork or chicken. Okay. So this is, this leads me to another point, another key thing. So let's say I'm watching this or listening to this and I'm like, Turka, I'm vegetarian. Um, what is carnosine and why is it important in this context? Well, I just, I was actually just on a podcast in with an Indian diabetic group in India, the subcontinent. And it was really interesting because, you know, they're obviously, they have a lot of vegetarians in India and, you know, they've been at it for a long time, thousands of years. Um, and one of the things that the vegetarians in India have figured out is that you have to have a certain amount of animal product in your diet and they typically use dairy because it doesn't violate their you know religious and moral rules which is you know i don't share their views but i recognize them and respect the motivation that puts them in you know that uh inspires them to eat that way um carnosine is a it's effectively an antioxidant it's really interesting um so if you go on a carnivore, if you go on a carnivore diet like you were on and you're doing, let's say, you know, you're Sean Baker and you're eating nothing but ribeyes and the occasional shrimp, um, you're doing two things. You're dramatically lowering the omega-6 intake that you're getting. You're going from the eight to 15% that the average American gets in their diet to the one to 2% that you're going to find in beef, right? So that's a huge improvement in my book. You're also going to get a lot of carnosine, which is, get carnosine, the name comes from car carne, beef, meat, right? Um, and it's effectively an antioxidant. And it's the most effective antioxidant against the toxins that seed oils turn into in your body. So you're getting a double helping of protection. You're lowering the cause of the problem and you're increasing your consumption of the anti-venom, if you want to look at it that way, since I ran into a rattlesnake the other day and I've been reading up on anti-venoms a lot, right? You know, meat is basically the anti-venom to seed oils to some extent. I mean, you still need to reduce your consumption, but that seems to be why, in my opinion, people who go on a carnivore diet see a lot of the benefits that they see, right? I mean, one of the con, and I've been through this with Dr. Baker and, you know, one of the things that he would always hear from people and that he noticed himself was people were like, why don't I get sunburned anymore? Well, he didn't, he didn't have an answer for that until I explained it to him and showed him what the mechanism was. And, you know, the toxin that H, this chemical called HNE for hydroxynononol um, is what carnosine protects you against. And it's one of the most toxic things that's produced from seed oils. So, you know, if you can, <laughs> uh, eat some beef. Um, is, is there any other non-meat based, non-animal pro product based uh, antioxidants that can have a similar effect? Not that I have come across. Oh, no, that's, I'm sorry, that's not true. Rosemary has, I think it's carnosic acid, and I'm not sure how similar they are, but rosemary, you know, the spice has a similar effect of protection from HNA. 
So how would, how would you consume rosemary though? Because it's not the most palatable thing just plucked off the branch, is it? Well, rosemary is a fine spice for lamb. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, when I make stews, I typically put a good dose of rosemary in there. I like the way it tastes. I guess, you know. Is, is it banned by I many? Like, I like liver too, and most people get sad. <laughs> so maybe I'm just weird that way. Is does it is it bound by many anti nutrients in the form of uh, lectins or oxalate or phytates or salicylates off the top of your head? Uh, I'm not really sure. I mean, any plant's going to have some anti nutrients pretty much by definition. So, um, you know, but I like the way it tastes and I can say, Ooh, I'm getting, I mean, I'm not eating much in the way of seed oils anyway. So I'm on, yeah. and I eat a lot of beef and lamb and stuff like that. So I'm not too concerned with getting an extra antioxidant, but these so, things can make it in my experience, they can make a big difference when you first start fixing your diet. Um, I mean, when I, uh, first started fixing my diet, one of the things that people were really hot on back then was, and that was, this was like 11 years ago, was fermented cod liver oil. Um, and I have this, you know, I'd always, always been kind of of the mind that your body is a machine that knows what its inputs should be. And to a certain extent, you have to follow your cravings, right? That if you're all of a sudden you want fish, you should probably eat fish, right? So when I got this cod liver oil, I didn't get pills or anything. I got a bottle of it that you had to eat with a spoon so I could taste it. And for about six months, it was all... Now, what was interesting, when I was at my sickest, I went through a period where I started worrying that I was had osteoporosis. I broke six bones in two years, you know, fingers, nose, ribs. Um, the last one was I fell and I, the tip of my thumb just snapped. And that was the one where I was like, okay, this is weird. That's not normal. Um, so at any rate, um, cod liver oil is a really good source of vitamin D and some other related fatty acid, uh, fat soluble vitamins that are good for building bones. And for six months, I literally couldn't go to night, go to bed at night without eating my teaspoonful of cod liver oil and nobody else in the house would touch the stuff because if you're not craving it it's foul <laughs> but to me it tasted like the best thing in the world and then one day I just forgot about it and I haven't had a spoonful of cod liver oil oil in 11 you know 10 and a half years so why that's interesting is there was a study that was done in the 20s where they took a bunch of orphans who had been malnourished. It's the sort of thing you could you know, never do nowadays. Although it was, in my opinion, a perfectly ethical, ethically reasonable study to do. They took a bunch of orphans who were all malnourished in various different ways and they put them in a room and they put a bunch of different foodstuffs in the room and they let them eat whatever they wanted to eat, right? And one of the things that they had was cod liver oil. And the kid, now they didn't tell them what to do. The kids just ate whatever they felt like eating, right? And the kid who had rickets ate the cod liver oil until he cured his rickets. And then he never touched it again. So there was, you know, like I suspect that me with my borderline osteoporosis and all the bones breaking, um, I was in the same situation that kid was. I was probably deficient, right? Now, I just came across a really neat paper. Um, and in the paper, they were talking about omega-3 versus omega-6. And the guy said, what I found from reading the literature is there are only two known ways to increase your omega-3 fats. One is to take more omega-3 fats and the other is to eat less omega-6 fats because there seems to be a deleterious effect. The omega-6 fats have a deleterious effect on the amount of omega-3 fats in your body. And you need both. You don't need much of either, but you do need both. But if you're eating too much omega-6, it seems to break down the omega-3 fats in your diet, which can have negative effects. That's so interesting. And you just reminded me, uh, 
about this whole egg thing that I was talking about before. Eggs contain uh, really good amounts of sulforaphane, I think. Yes. And and I was That's reading. Why they stink the way they do when they go bad. Yeah, and I, and I was reading something about when your body is deficient. Um, it's obviously not great, but what I, what I what my point is what I think may have happened is that I've replenished my sulforaphane stocks and my body maybe with the nausea was like, Oh, you got enough. That's enough. Yeah. What do you, what are your thoughts on that being a possibility? Well, I think that's true of a lot of things. I mean, you know, certainly if you ever get something that's over salted, it's repulsive, right? Whereas salt in general makes food taste better. If you, you know, if you've ever <laughs> had that, top of a salt shaker fall off and then you try and rescue your meal you're out of luck <laughs> so yeah no i think that and you know i mean it's interesting there are uh studies that show that one of the effects of putting people eating too much seed oils is they get nauseous and you know one of the scientists who found this out is the guy who's now the chief medical officer of verta health and their, one of their recommendations is avoiding seed oils in part because of the toxic effect, not just sign of food toxicity, generally. Well, it's one of the things that can cause nausea, obviously, is eating something that's gonna make you ill. Your, you know, your body's a survival machine. And one of the things that it does is say, don't eat that stupid, right? I mean, that's why you get sick when you drink too much. Your body's often fruitlessly telling you not to do that anymore. <laughs> Well, uh, I, thankfully, I'm celebrating my fifth year of sobriety uh, on Bravo. August 26th. Yeah, thanks. But it's um, there's no judgment here for drinkers, but I cannot bear the thought of being hungover. And and uh, what I think is happening, Tucker, is that my body has become not sensitive, but I've become hyper dialed into uh, what my body likes, can tolerate, and what it what it doesn't like. And one one point I was going to make a good friend of mine, Niall Clerken, who's a uh, an up and coming health coach who's uh, uh, on a similar diet to me. He's had some, uh, he's a bit older than me and he's trying to reverse some uh, CAC stuff and just doing a few experiments. But we were talking about how, like it's been nearly three years that I've been on 99% animal protein and my, the amount of food that I require is, is coming down. My work, I'm still running 70 Ks a week, you know, 40 miles or whatever it is. Uh, plus I'm doing body weight stuff. Plus I'm doing, using my brain for all this other stuff. Like my caloric load's still ultra high, but I don't need as much. You know, I did a 48 hour fast that I broke yesterday with uh, eight patties and cheese. And it's the only time I try and have dairy apart from a bit of butter. But like I did a five kilometer run yesterday morning, 40 hours fasted. Um, I didn't have buckets of energy, but afterwards I felt really good, man. Yeah, well, ketones make you feel really good. And there's no better way to get ketones going than to, you know, not eat any carbohydrates or fast and then go for a run or something. You know, that's one of your basic fuel sources, despite all the nonsense you hear about the keto ketogenic diet. I mean, ketones are perfectly natural and an expected fuel source when you're exercising. So yeah, that's, well, you know, and that's you're, part, sorry. sorry, I was going to say think, you're, you're a fan of fasting, uh, training fasted as well for a number of reasons. Yeah. For, um, I mean, that was one of the things, you know, so like I said, I used to, you know, I, I still ski, but, um, I used to ski and I would have oatmeal for breakfast and I would go out and I would get the shakes after a couple of runs, right? I would get into this energy deficit. And so I would go in God help me now, and I would have a plate of French fries and that would give me some energy and I would go back out and I would go do another couple of runs. And then, um, I would start getting the shakes again, you know, what people call hypoglycemia or hangry, right. Which is, uh, more properly known as adrenergic postprandial syndrome, right? That's when you 
don't eat for a bit and your body goes into panic mode. Um, and then when I fixed my diet, I couldn't eat the oatmeal anymore because I couldn't get any gluten-free oatmeal and I couldn't eat, I wouldn't eat the French fries because it was cooked in seed oil. So I would have coffee <laughs> half and half. And I would go all day. I could skip lunch. And it was just like, this is cool. I don't get these, I don't bonk. I was bonking after a half an hour of activity. It's crazy. And I mean, you know, it's a sign of fitness, how long it takes you to bonk. The first time I ran a half marathon, I bonked at about mile 12. And I, mean, you know. What is bonking for those who don't know, apart from bonking. a way to make love? <laughs> Well, yeah, it doesn't have that sense here in the U.S. Maybe that's an Australian way of putting it. But, um, well, I guess it does, actually. I shouldn't say that. But if you're an athlete and you're bonking, it generally refers to your body's running out of glucose, right? So that's why runners carry all these gels and things, which is like glucose syrup around, so that when they run low on sugar, they can take more sugar and hopefully get themselves through things. That's why when you run a marathon, they have this thing called the wall at about 20 miles in, because if you know you do the arithmetic, that's when your body's glucose stores run low. And if you haven't trained yourself to burn fat, you just, the tank runs dry, right? And I mean, literally they see in obese people, you know, if you, I mean, it's so I mentioned before that one of the symptoms of diabetes is that you have these fat globules inside your muscle cells and inside your muscles, right? Well, what's really interesting is that's also the sign of a trained athlete, right? Because basically the symptom of it, one of the signs of a trained athlete is the ability to burn fat for energy, right? Which allows you to put off that bonk farther. Um, so one of the things that you see in obese people is that these fat globules have actually moved away from the mitochondria inside the cell. So literally the gas tank has been disconnected from the engine, right? And it's one of the reasons why if you look at what makes people obese, having being unable to burn fat for energy will make you obese. And it shouldn't be surprising because your body, every time you eat carbohydrates, converts a little bit of it to fat for later. But if you can never access that fat, you know, it's like a bathtub with the drain stopped up. You keep pouring water in it. <laughs> Sooner or later, you, you know, it's going to make you overweight. So um, anyway, so the, one of the tricks for fixing obesity is not just changing what you eat, but also doing some amount of exercise. And you commented on how when you were too, you know, what you did was very smart. You didn't do hard exercise when you were overweight because you'll get hurt doing that, right? But you can walk, anybody can walk. What you wanna do is some sort of simple low grade exercise to get your body to move those fat stores back in connection with your mitochondrial motors and, get the system working again because you can't lose fat if you can't burn fat you have to train your body to do that right that's what athletic training is all about is you know you mentioned phil maffetone he was one of the guys who figured this out and was able to quantify it really well that's the point of athletic training is or one of the points is training your body to be able to burn, burn fat well, in, in the time- I We haven't gone off on too much of a tangent No, there, I, I, I think people will find this, I mean, I find it fascinating, Tucker. So I'm, I hope that people will too and appreciate the tangent because in the time that you and I uh, have spoken, I'm, um, as soon as the registration's available, will be attempting to run my first 100 kilometer on zero uh, plant-based carbohydrate. Um, or or any carbohydrate apart from the natural amounts and, and animal um, protein. And I'm right. uh, so I'll, I'll be taking a combination of uh, electrolytes, potassium, magnesium, sodium. I might try and get some of those natural element uh, sachets from um, Rob Wolf and uh, and beef short rib fat or lamb shoulder fat, because when I attempted the 100K in December 2020, I remember I got through the first 91 kilometers on less than 200 grams of carbohydrate. 
uh, which was through coconut water, some cheese and some milk. I want to try it without the milk, uh, without the cheese and without the um, coconut water. And I believe that I've become so fat adapted, uh, as I believe you have been or are, that I can do this without, you know, going over about a 140 heart rate and depleting my glycolytic load. Um, how, how is that possible? Well, it's possible in two ways. First off, our body's designed to run on fat, right? I mean, if you just look at it as a machine, you know, 95 plus percent of the energy stores in a human body is in the form of fat, right? Only max 5% is stored glucose in the form of glycogen in your muscles and your liver. So clearly... <laughs> <laughs> you know, humans have been around and running probably for, we think, 4.3 million years. The gel was invented, what, 30 years ago? <laughs> I mean, you We're know, so most, smart. We're so smart, aren't we? I know. For most of human history, we were running around barefoot and with no immediate source of carbohydrates. So, yes, the machine is designed to run off fat. Now, you can get into lots of interesting discussions about uh, is a little bit of carbohydrate going to tweak that system and give you a little performance edge, which the evidence seems to be that that's the case. But we're talking about a little bit of carbohydrate, not, you know, chugging sugar the whole race. Um, but, you know, you humans are evolved to be long distance runners and hunters. And we are not a successful species because we bonked. Because if you were out chasing down dinner and for a good chunk of human history, literally the only way we had of hunting was running animals down until they were exhausted. We didn't have, you know, we may have had spears. We didn't have bows and arrows. We certainly didn't have guns, right? We would just chase them down. And if you didn't catch it, you had to go do it again the next day. And at that point, you were definitely exercising fasted. Right? So, I mean, this is, this is what we've evolved for. And, you know, this is how the machine is supposed to work. Let the machine work the way it's supposed to work. Chugging carbohydrates the whole time you're exercising is a modern invention. And yes, I, you know, look, if it's sort of like, you know, if you've got a, car and you know the drag racers was would put in nitrous oxide into their engine because it would give them a little performance boost and i mean there's you know a really good argument that putting in a little bit of extraneous carbohydrate when you're running can give you a little bit of an extra performance boost you know i mean zach zach bitter who's a world record holder runner that's what he does and he's you know i've talked to him about this and he says if he doesn't do that he finds that you know he's not quite as fast so great do that but he takes a fraction of what a high carb a carb addicted athlete does right? yeah he, he's he's a wonderful human being he actually gave me some coaching uh before i did my very first ultra in 2018 um via, yeah, via skype and uh the pace that he's running at is about a minute and a half faster than what i'm attempting this 100k at uh, per kilometer rather so um I, I'm keen to finish it at about six minute pace, so maybe 12 hours. It's a, it's 26 laps of a botanical gardens around here in the central part of Melbourne. Um, it's pretty boring, but- uh, You're I'm a brave just... man, I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> well, I did the 50K a couple of years ago, and at about the 40 kilometer mark, had a, um, a face blindness uh, issue that happened. I didn't know a lot about nutrition or electrolytes back then, and ended up kissing who I thought was my new girlfriend at the time. Um, and it turns out it was a complete stranger, but I've already shared that um, story on a podcast and uh, I still don't have a criminal record. She was very understanding and gave me an eight out of 10 for the kiss. Um, well, bravo. Nicely done. <laughs> so um, let's talk about this barefoot running because I know this is a big passion project of yours. Um, what do you want to talk about, Tucker? Yeah, so the, baref the barefoot running thing was, I mean, first off, it's, People ask me what the most influential book I've ever read was. And without question, it was that Born to Run book by Chris McDougall. Um, 
I had never been much of a runner when I was a kid. I had this condition called Osgood Schlatter's, which they now think is uh, the result of a vitamin deficiency. And I can't off the top of my head, I think it may be a selenium deficiency, but at any rate, what it means is that when you run your, the top of your shin bone swells up and gets really painful. So through high school, I wasn't, couldn't run, didn't go to gym, you know, I became a fencer because, you know, running fencing. Um, so anyway, but I, you know, I went to college and I had a friend who was a runner and he tried to convince me to do it. And then when I started putting on weight, I, you know, got into rollerblading and then tried to get back into running and I would always suffer with shin splints. Um, so I could never, you know, I would like run five miles and I couldn't run for two, two months because my legs would hurt so much. Wow. Um, so there were a couple of exceptions though to that rule. One of which was when I was kayaking once up in Maine, I had these felt sold reef slippers. So it was like basically a sock with a tabby toe, you know, with a separate big toe and just a little bit of felt on the bottom so that you could, you know, they were like the shoes, shoes a surfer would wear. And I used these kayaking and I went on this kayaking trip where I was going down a river and then I kept having to portage the kayak from body of water to body of water. And wearing these little flat things, I discovered that it was easier to run than to walk. And I wasn't a runner at that point. And, you know, I was, I just remember, I had this memory for years of, you know, wearing these things and running through the woods of Maine, carrying my kayak over my shoulder and just feeling like it was the greatest thing in the world. And I never really, I never made the connection to the shoes. In hindsight, I realized that's what it was. I do re remember how much my calves hurt after doing that for several miles, um, which is a typical first barefoot run experience for people, FYI, don't go too far the first time. <laughs> um, and then, you know, when I moved out of New York City to Connecticut, I started running in these sandals um, for the same reason. They were flat. They had no uh, arch support. And, you know, also they were sandals, so they're a lot cooler. So, you know, I just kind of always gravitated towards these minimalist shoes. And then I, when I got into trail running, entirely by dumb, dumb luck, I bought a pair of trail racing shoes that were like slippers. And... I could run. <laughs> I didn't get shin splints. And then they wore out and I couldn't find a replacement that looked like that was as minimalist as them. And I kind of got out of running again. And it wasn't until I really read that born to run book that I was like, wait a minute, this is what the only good memories I have of running in my life is when I was wearing these minimalist shoes. And according to this, that's the right thing to do. And it makes perfect sense you know again as i said we've been running you know the oldest fossil we have of a modern human foot is from 4.3 million years ago right up until the 20th century most people didn't wear shoes most of the time you know and then all of a sudden in the 20th century we all went insane and decided we had to wear shoes with a huge wedge of wedge of foam under our heels um dan lieberman who was the scientist interviewed in Born to Run in chapter 25. Um, I saw him speak up in up at Harvard years ago. And he was like, he said, he's a real character. He said, shin splints are a sign that you're running like an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> and he's exactly right. And Spot since on. I've since I've gone with minimalist shoes, A, I became a runner. I really love to run. B, I haven't had shin splints in 11 years. And I mean, I've, you know, I have some other leg issues that are kind of off on another tangent that doesn't have anything to do with uh, running or anything or diet. But so I've only been ever been able to run 20 miles, but I mean, I can run 20 miles. I don't get any shin splints. And I've you know, one of the interesting, one of the most interesting things for me was I always used to roll my ankles when I was running or hiking. Um, it's been 11 years and I haven't rolled an ankle. 
I've stepped on rocks that have rolled out from under me. I have, you know, run in the snow. I had a bridge once flip at a 45 degree angle when I was running across at a plank bridge, didn't fall down, didn't sprain, you know, it's completely eliminated the ankle sprain for me. And it's pretty simple explanation. When you don't have much under your foot, you can feel what's happening <laughs> and your body just reacts, right? Your body, you step on a rock, it rolls out. You just throw yourself over to the side, you put your foot down and you keep going. It's been, it's been amazing. And, you know, I mean, I've, my fiance, that was a funny dinner when my, my fiance and I went to high school together and just got back together two years ago. And the dinner, you know, when we went out to dinner, we hadn't seen each other since the 1990s. We go out to dinner and, you know, I mean, this is what always happens to me when I go out to dinner is I've got to negotiate with the waiter, you know, I'm gluten-free, blah, blah, blah. What can I eat here? You know, so I wind up at this restaurant eating a plate full of sausages and a glass of hard cider. And she's like, why are you eating that? They have all of this nice stuff on the menu. She's got like a bowl of pasta, you know? And so we go through that whole thing. And then she starts, we start talking about hiking and she goes, oh yes, I've got a problem with my feet. I've got this bone that broke that never healed right. And I have to wear these big hiking boots and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, you should try running in some sandals. She's like, she looks at me like I'm out of my mind. <laughs> She's like, no, no, I, you have no idea how much energy I put into trying to find what these boots are. You know, these boots are what I need. And if I go walking, I'm in a lot of pain and blah, 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 blah. Well, long story short, I fairly shortly had her in a pair of these Luna sandals, these Horachis that were, you know, designed by one of the guys who was in this book, Born to Run. 15 mile hike. She couldn't believe it. She's, you know, hasn't worn those boots in a couple of years. All of her foot problems virtually have healed up. Um, you know, it was amazing. She's like, I've been living with this for eight years. The doctors that had her in orthotics and these heavy boots. And I put her in a pair of sandals and in a couple of weeks, fix most of her foot problems. A couple of weeks. It's, it's mind boggling. It Just is, by wearing, doing what you're supposed to be doing, which is walking in your feet without having all this crap on them. There's a common theme here, Tucker. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't there? There is a, a common theme here. I want to explore one other further part with regards to this running. I uh, in, in, I'm, I go through periods where I've been trying to transition to barefoot. Uh, when I was battling with my sugar cravings, which I uh, knock on wood at this point, I'm now nearly a month without any at all. And I, as part of the 90 day challenge, thank you. I feel like I'm free of it now. It feels different to every other time. And as a result, I've lost uh, five kilos of body weight in uh, 25 days or whatever it is, right? No shock. I'm expecting to lose another four or five. Uh, as I get leaner and lighter, being able to transition to barefoot, becomes a lot easier. Where I live, there's a lot of pavement. Um, I love to run on the grass. I love the grounded feeling. There seems to be some science suggesting blood viscosity improves when you are connected to the earth. Do you know much about that particular subject at all? I haven't heard anything on that. I, I will tell you, um, the easiest surfaces to run on are the hardest surfaces. So if you can find some limestone or marble to run on, it will feel like you are flying, right? Because the way your feet, the way humans, it's interesting, humans and kangaroos have the same locomotion system, right? Kangaroos hop on both feet and they're using the elastic properties of their tendons and their muscles to propel themselves along. Humans do the same thing one foot to the other foot, right? So once you realize that's how the machine is supposed to work, then you realize that the harder the surface you're running on, the more energy you get returned to your legs and the easier running becomes, right? So it also means that it suddenly starts looking really dumb to put foam under your feet because foam absorbs energy 
and turns it into heat, right? So this energy that is supposed to cause you to pop back up in the air is getting sucked up by your foam sneakers, right? Not a great idea. Um, so if you can find some marble, I, ran, I did a run, I think I was in Washington, DC, and I ran across one of the marble, you know, they have these like marble plazas and I took my shoes off and I was like, oh my God, this is fabulous. The hardest thing to run on is sand <laughs> because sand just mushes away, right? When you land, there's no energy return. So you've got to like all the energy that you need to go back up in the air comes from your muscles. You don't get a bounce back. So grass is really hard because grass absorbs a lot of the energy. So when you're starting out doing it, I would recommend start by walking in your bare feet, right? Get up to like, you know, you don't have to do a heck of a lot of walking, but you need to do enough. You may have done this already, but I'm just saying, you know, as a general principle. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Do enough walking so the bottom of your feet get pretty tough. Always bring a spare pair of shoes with you. The minute your feet start to hurt, put your shoes on. There are no badges for toughing it out here. I mean, one of the dumbest stories I ever heard was a biologist, Bernd Heinrich, who he may not now, but anyway, he at one point had a world record as an ultra runner. Um, and this knucklehead, he was a biologist, right? He decided, he heard about Dan Lieberman's research of humans as runners and Heinrich was in Africa and decided to go out for a run barefoot. 14 miles, his first try. He came back and his feet were in ribbons. Do not do that, right? Take your shoes. The minute, the instant it starts feeling uncomfortable, put your shoes back on and then finish your run. Go for a mile run. Do the first 200 yards barefoot. And then if it starts to hurt, put your shoes back on. And just keep doing that, extend the distance to where it stops being comfortable. And I mean, my experience was one day, you know, I was doing like this six mile loop and I got up to the point where I could do three miles barefoot easily. And then I would put my shoes on. And then one day I just didn't need to put the shoes on. And I did the six mile loop. I doubled my distance and I got home and I was like, wow, that's great. And then after a little while, I got to the point where I just didn't bother bringing the shoes anymore but bring the shoes. Don't be a dope about it. <laughs> right? yeah, Make it, it should be easy. It should feel easy. It's natural, but it's just like, you know, I mean, you know, my parents never let me go outside barefoot when I was a kid, but most people remember, remember at the beginning of the season, you know, I mean, I say that living in Connecticut where it'd be cold and icy in the winter, you know, in the spring, when you would take your shoes off and start walking around barefoot, my friends would be like, ooch, 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 you know, it really sense, really sensitive. And they knew that by the middle of the summer, they could run around on anything because their feet would have adapted to it. So you need to go through that process. It's going to hurt at first. Well, feet I, are soft and tender. They are. And one, one, uh, it, well, a few instances that have happened to me when I've been barefoot, Tucker, is it's felt almost orgasmic in a non-sexual org orgasmic uh in in my feet and obviously there's heaps of uh sensitivity points or uh points to other parts of your body what's i don't know what the yes the, what's the medicine regarding feet like not podiatry but like the fact like the links between your feet and your heart like the chinese do it and oh i don't i don't know about that but i will say that when i started uh hiking in uh vibram five fingers it was a sensual experience. I mean, it was almost sexual. And, you know, that shouldn't surprise us because your, you know, your hands and your, the area around your lips and your feet are the most, have the most nerve endings in your body. Now, evolution isn't dumb. They put all those nerve endings in your feet so you can feel what you're running on, right? <laughs> Only people who think they're smart then say, oh, let's put two inches of foam under there so you can't feel anything. No, the nerve endings are there for a reason. And yeah, the first time, boy, I I mean, it was an amazing feeling. And it, I hate to say it does go away. You get used to it. You lose that like sensual feeling of walking and 
feeling everything with the nerve endings in your feet, but enjoy it while it lasts. It was amazing. And if you know what's good for your relationship, give your partner a foot rub. Uh, you can thank yeah. me later. <laughs> um, exactly. Tucker, we've touched on a very confronting uh, number of points today. And I know people are screaming out, fuck, what do I do? How, like, how do I live my life? This sounds like it's all too much information. I'm just going to go back to eating those, the deep fried chicken and the French fries. What's some key takeaways from advice that you can give people to help improve their lives? Well, it's not complicated. You just need to do what we evolved to do, right? We try and be clever and we're too clever by half. I mean, I'll tell you one of the one of the most amazing amazing things I learned when I was getting into this barefoot running thing, which really holds for just as a basic observation. I, you know, as I said, I lived in Connecticut. It's cold and snowy in the winter. You know, as Dan Lieberman likes to say, we evolved to run barefoot, but not in Massachusetts in the winter. Well, Connecticut's right next to Massachusetts. Um, so I decided I wanted to get myself some barefoot style shoes that didn't have any cushioning underneath and were flat and, you know, and you couldn't buy any boots like that. So I found this company in Wisconsin that did, that made custom boots. And I call them up and I describe what I want. And the woman who answers the phone says, oh, you're going to talk to the owner. And, oh, I hate to say it, but I can't remember the owner's name right now. Um, I can't remember the name. It's uh, Mark. I'll, I'll get to, I'll, the name will come back to me. I'm sure before the story is gonna uh, is gonna end. So anyway, she goes. You know, you've got to talk to the owner. He's the only one who can handle a request like this. So I'm like, okay, Ralph Fabricius. That was his name. So she puts Ralph on the phone. Ralph is 89 years old, right? And so I start describing what I want, and he cuts me off, and he goes, "Oh, you want some of the old army style boots?" And I'm like. No, 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 no. I want some, you know, barefoot boots. And I'm thinking big army clod hoppers. And he goes, oh, no, this guy Munson, he did all this research back in the early 1900s. The old army style boots are barefoot style boots. And he goes, he wrote a book about it. You can probably find it on the Internet. And he sent me a copy of this book ultimately before I was able to find it on the Internet. And I'm like... Oh my goodness. Sure enough, this doctor was put in charge of the army's foot health during the run up to World War I. And there was a scientist who had come along and shown the difference between people's feet in shoes and barefoot people's feet, right? And this guy, Munson, who was one of the top doctors in the United States, Brigadier, Brigadier, he was a Brigadier General when he retired. When um, President McKinley was shot, Munson was one of the doctors they called to come treat him. So he's literally one of the top doctors in the country. And Munson looked at this barefoot stuff and then looked at all of the soldiers. They had a 30 to 40% dropout rate because of injuries on army marches at that point. And Munson said, it's the shoes. We need to come up with some shoes that enable your feet to work the way they're supposed to work. And he developed the GI boot, what became known as the Munson Last, which was wider. It allowed you to straighten your big toe out when you were marching. And he, in his book, describes all of the foot problems that would heal, like fallen arches and high arches something that still blows their mind when I tell people their high arches are a function of poor shoes. Um, ITB? Huh? Billy IT Vance. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. IT Vance syndrome is, well, we'll we can get into that. But so Munson got the injury rate on army marches down to zero by putting them all in barefoot style shoes, as Ralph had said. Um, so, Ra you know, Ralph made me you know, God bless him. I'm sure he's passed by now, but for free made me two pairs of these barefoot style moccasins per the army's 
blueprint developed in the early 1900s and they're still my favorite some of my favorite shoes um so they made millions of these gi boots this was the army boot through world war one world war ii the korean war and the vietnamese war and then they forgot about it they forgot Nobody remembers this stuff. You can buy, there are two companies that still make a boot on a Munson last, but we knew all of this stuff over a hundred years ago and we just forgot it, right? We knew the fix to foot problems. <laughs> they made millions of these boots, you know? They became, they, they became known as old men's boots because there were guys who would swear by their army's boots because they were oh, so comfortable. By dumb luck, when I found this out, I was like, wait a minute. I had this pair of boots that I had bought from L.L. Bean that were the most comfortable shoes I had ever owned. And I went back and I looked at them and they were built on the months and last. You know, it didn't mean anything to me when I bought them, but I was always like, wow, these are the best shoes I've ever owned. These things are great. We knew all of this stuff, right? We know all this stuff. We try and be clever by making these fancy shoes like the army does now. The army's got one of the biggest injury problems in the US Army now are running injuries, right? When Munson wrote his book, they didn't exist. So we've taken, we've made these problems. We've made this problem of running injuries and foot problems. And we've made all these diet problems by trying to be too smart and not just doing simple stuff like eating what we evolved to eat, not eating all this new industrial garbage, right? Not wearing these ridiculous fancy shoes. They make it worse. They don't make it better. And just being simple can often have just amazing effects on your health and your well being. I mean, you know, I'm 11 years older than I was when I started this thing, and I am in so much better health than I was then. It's just crazy what a difference it's made to me. I mean, when I, you know, again, when my fiance and I got together, she was on all these meds and, you know, doing all this stuff and wearing these big shoes and she we got she had a conversation with me one day she's like when's the last time you took a pill and I was like I haven't taken a pill in 11 in 10 years why would I take a pill I did break my streak last year because I got bit by a darn tick and had to go on antibiotics but you know what can you do <laughs> I, I wonder if some uh, extended fasting might have knocked that on the head in, a, in the same way if you like if you had the capacity or maybe some more knowledge on that. those tick-borne diseases. I mean, I have heard of people who had chronic Lyme disease who went on a keto diet and got it under control, but they're nasty. Take yeah. the antibiotics. I mean, that's a quick fix. I mean, it was swelling up so fast. I was like, get this the heck out of me. Um, and I suppose now, anyway. that you know, now that you know how to fix your, your gut and replenish a lot of the flora, uh, that that's more empowering because the antibiotics which is a whole nother rabbit hole um uh my gut health that's that's the fundamental because i had an autoimmune disease as well right and and when my gut is functioning beautifully i develop that non-sexual orgasmic feeling that i described in my feet in my gut and that's oh really so i've i've spoken to yeah well i've spoken to two gastroenterologists about this one won a nobel prize i spoke to you about professor barry marshall he was unable yes. to explain i spoke to dr pran yoganathan who's a carnivore um, gastroenterologist over here in australia an amazing guy and the epitome of what you want to see when you go see a gastro because he's jacked um and and uses the carnivore diet for to, to help people and if he goes to his prescription pad feels like he's failed so I got mad respect for him. I spoke to Ruben Meerman, who's a scientist called the surfing scientist in Queensland. Uh, he wasn't able to explain why my poo uh, has no smell or only smells like the ocean when I go only meat. And, um, and <laughs> maybe and then, TMI, but God bless you there. <laughs> well, I also asked uh, Dr. Robert Lustig about it as well. And, and like, no one's able to give me a, uh, you know, no fiber, just, so anyway, I'm going on a tangent here, but people are sick of hearing about my poo, but um, it, it's just so interesting. Like I look at everything through an evolutionary lens 
is that what my forefathers would have done? No, then why the fuck would I be doing it? So that's what I would encourage people to do. Tucker, where do people find you and what projects have you got coming up that are of interest to our audience? Uh, well, I my blog is yelling-stop.blogspot.com. And it, I'll put that in the links below. Um, it's, you know, I mean, I've got literally thousands of posts in there. I've been going at it in that thing since 2009. Um, so there's a lot of barefoot running stuff. There's a lot of diet stuff. Um, some really long form things that I should organize a little better, but, um, I'm very active on Twitter at Tucker Goodrich. Um, I'm working on a book uh, about all this nonsense, mostly focused on the seed oil stuff. And I have um, recently started working with a quote unquote stealth mode startup as a consultant on a solution to the seed oil problem. So that's really interesting and exciting. And at some point I'll be able to talk a little bit more about what that actually will entail, but it's a neat, project with a neat bunch of guys bunch that of people sounds, i should say that sounds really really interesting and uh one of the comments that um dr robert lustig made when i was interviewing him recently was uh, 10 years ago uh we didn't know what we were talking about we you know it'll be vindicated that we won't know what we were talking about in 10 years from now um and we're on this constant uh learning um program and, and and with the benefit of retrospect i disagree i think oh i more entirely we... disagree with him on that yeah and i will tell you one of my biggest issues when i was supervising a team of engineers was an engineer who made a change to a system and it didn't produce the desired result and he wasn't willing to back it out people get an ego about their supposed fixes, right? And my thing was always just undo it, take it back to where it was before. I won't be upset with you. We'll figure out why it didn't work. And then we'll do, you know, we'll try it again. First thing to do, get the system back to known good, right? Physicians are the worst when it comes to that. They come up with a little idea like LDL is killing you. And then they keep trying to tweak it and throw new gadgets at it. That's rookie engineering mistake 101. If you screw up a system, go to known good, back it out. So no, yes. If you keep <laughs> finding that you're, you know, oh, we still don't know what we're doing. It's because you're going down a bad path. Turn around, go back. Right. Rule number one, when you're lost in the woods, go back to when you weren't lost. <laughs> and it's a recurring theme with with the people that I seem to identify with the most, Tucker, like that, that they are humble enough to admit when they make mistakes. And this is the journey that I'm on as well. I, want, I love sharing the knowledge that I have uh, and and tweaking it, you know, like I, I, I'm open yeah. to, you know, tweaking it as, as I need to. And if it turns out that I'm wrong about everything that I've been talking about, I'll fall on my sword, but I'm one thing I can tell you, Tucker, I reckon I'm on the right path. I reckon, particularly with diet and nutrition, a lot of this other stuff, I really believe I'm on the right path. And I can, well, you can, you can tell just by looking at you, you can tell by looking in the mirror. I remember the day when I looked in the mirror and I thought to myself, wow, you're getting old. And I mean, that was 12 years ago. And, you know, when I fixed my diet, one of the first things that happened was everybody at work was like, wow, what are you doing? You look great. You look so much younger. I started getting carded. I got carded by a gay <laughs> bartender. I was like, this is awesome. That's a compliment. <laughs> and which is tell. amazing because you're 106 yeah. as well and you look fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sadly, I don't think this is going to make me immortal. But, you know, if if. There's a Japanese saying, pin pin karori, uh, and it translates to be healthy, drop dead, right? Be healthy, robust until you are an old person, and then you should just die quickly and peacefully. And that's all any of us can ask for. 
Yeah, you want to die peacefully, not uh, screaming um, like the passengers in your car. Uh, <laughs> do, you, do you have any concluding thoughts for our audience, Tucker? No, I'll tell you, um, you know, a lot of the people overcomplicate this stuff. Um, when my fiance and I got back together, she had put on some weight and she was vegan, by the way, um, or mostly vegan. And she asked me what, uh, what she should do. And I said, you know, I didn't want to get, she was vegan. I didn't want to get into an argument with it, uh, with her about it. So I just said, I, I told her one sentence, right? Just a sentence. And a couple of weeks later, she called, called me up and she said, okay, I've done what you told me to do. And I've lost 17 pounds so far from a sentence. It doesn't have to be complicated. You know, I found out afterwards that she had been fighting an autoimmune disease, uh, fibromyalgia for 30 years, and that's in remission completely. So a sentence, it doesn't have to be complicated. Keep it simple. You'll be better off. Tucker, the work that you are doing truly is, is extraordinary. And we are so thankful that you are on this planet and, and went through what you went through, the blessing of adversity, I love to call this. And I think that might be the title of one of my books in the future, The Blessing of Adversity, so don't steal it. Um, for, people, for people that are curious to, to, to know more about this, there is some brilliant interviews between Tucker and Joe McCola, uh, you and Frank Defano, you and Paul Saladino, uh, and there'll be more and more. Uh, Ivor Cummins, get on YouTube, educate yourself, educate your family, and lead by example. Be the change you want to see in the world. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Tucker Goodrich. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much.